Ken Hauk, who has been an incredible collaborator with many, many experimentalists to put them on the right track to understand what their chemistry is doing. And he's been a, he's been a wonderful contributor within the center, really showing the, the, the type of approach towards collaborative research that we are trying to encourage. So it's a great honor to be able to uh, uh, introduce Ken. And the title of his talk is Computational Explorations of Mechanisms and Sel Selectivities of CH Functionalization. Okay, thanks very much. You? Am I? Can you hear me? <laughs> I assume so. Okay, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, I'm here by myself in my office, but there's a group of people in at UCLA down in our conference room, and uh, I've emailed you a selfie already, so you can show that in the future. So um, I'm going to talk about, can you change to the next slide, please? Um, and then the next slide. I'm, the general thing I'd like to talk about today is first give you some introduction to computational methods. It'll be very brief, but give, give you an idea of the kinds of things we do. Secondly, I'll talk about the collaborations that we've experienced, both inside the center and with groups outside the center. And finally, I'll talk about some recent discoveries, still unpublished work that's in progress, but I think it will be interesting. Next slide. And these are the three topics. I'm going to talk about palladium catalysis, and then I'll talk about potassium t-butoxide catalyzed silylation reactions, and finally, uh, the use of enzymes to introduce oxygen functionality at late stages in synthesis. Next slide. So here is the uh, brief introduction to computational methods. There are two computational groups in the center, my group at UCLA, and also Jamal Musayev's group at Emory. And both of us uh, use a variety of computational methods to study chemistry, often in collaboration with other groups. Uh, the first part of my talk is transition metal cat catalysis. And there we use a density functional known as M06. It's from Don Trular's group at Minnesota. And this has proven to be quite useful for the uh, quantitative calculation of reaction barriers for organometallic reactions. We've also been using a more recent uh, functional called Omega B97XD from Martin Ed Gordon at Berkeley. Um, and in all cases, we do solvation energy calculations because, of course, the experiments have been done in solvent. And we'd like to simulate the effect of solvent. And we use uh, various empirical solvation models. In this case, we've been using Trular and Kramer's SMD model. The second part of my talk is in basically an organic reaction mechanism, although it involves silicon. And uh, we use quantum mechanics there. It's, um, it's a different type of quantum mechanics. It's from Trular also, but M062X is something that's really been tested for a variety of thermodynamics and reaction barriers. And we find that to be a, quite a useful functional. We also use the uh, venerated 20-year-old, uh, somewhat maligned, functional B3LYP. This is uh, quite a rapid way to explore geometries and transition states. We, in general, do uh, other functionals to get the final energetics. And so we do our first exploration with B3LYP and then move on to another functional. And again, we use a uh, solvation model, in this case, a so-called Cosmo polarized continuum model. And then the last part of my talk, I'll I'll be uh, talking about enzyme catalyzed reactions. We do quantum mechanics. Uh, again, now it's B3LYP with a dent, uh, dispersion correction called D3 from uh, Grima's group. And uh, we then use a continue, uh, continue model for solvation. And I'll also talk about uh, molecular dynamic simulations where we use a different kind of calculation, namely uh, an empirical force field calculation with amber. It's a force field um, that the program and a force field for these kinds of computations. There's some details about the specific force field on the slide. Next slide, please. So let's turn to the first problem, which has to do with the collaboration with Jin Chuan Yu's group at Scripps. And the work was done by, uh, in my group, by Buck Taylor, who's now on the faculty at Carleton. Uh, Seth Alquist, a recent grad of uh, UCLA undergrad, is going to med school soon, but working in my group in the meantime. And uh, Yun Feng Yang is a postdoc in my group. Next slide. 
we've published some papers with Chinchon already having to do with using computations to try to understand how his template directed uh, CH functionalizations work. So uh, I won't talk about this in detail, but we've published already a, a paper about the mechanism of meta direction by this template that's shown. It uh, has a nitrile that presumably coordinates to the catalyst. And what we found computationally was that a palladium silver heterodimer uh, seems to be involved. That gives the lowest energy barriers for these reactions. The reaction involves uh, subsequent uh, olefination to give the product shown on the far right. Next slide. This area is a little tricky because we found that this uh, hydrocinamic acid template um, operates by a different mechanism, namely the added amino acid, the uh, N-acetylglycine, seems to be involved in the CMD process that gives the CH activation. And uh, it seems to be a function of the uh, length of the template, uh, some other features that determine what is the specific catalyst is involved in the reaction. Next slide, please. In the current example, uh, this is as yet unpublished, but soon to be submitted, is a benzoic acid derivative, uh, a somewhat simpler template than I showed you before. Uh, and again, it's a meta-selective. The conditions are similar, palladium-2, uh, anastylglycine additive, and an excess of the silver acetate oxidant. Next slide, please. And we've explored four possible mechanisms. They're just shown briefly here, a transition state on the left would be the CMD involving the amino acid ligand. Yeah, the blue is the palladium silver heterodimer. The line here is just to represent the template in, in uh, schematic. In the third case would be a palladium dimer involved in the reaction. And the fourth is a more traditional CMD involving the palladium acetate reacting directly or palladium pivolate uh, is often used. Next slide. And here are the um, energetics for these different processes for attack at the meta ortho or para position. The lowest energy process we compute is involves the palladium silver uh, complex uh, that has the lowest activation barrier and also nicely explains the meta selectivity. Next slide, please. We explored the role of the additive N-acetylglycine because the yield is higher in the presence of the N-acetylglycine. And as you saw, my uh, transition state for CH activation had, didn't have any N-acetylglycine. But what we found is shown here, these are the potential energies along the reaction pathway or the free energies along the reaction pathway. From the left side to near the middle, that intermediate at uh, 5.3 or 5.7 kilocalories per mole, that's the formation of the complex that then does the CH activation. And uh, what we found is that the n glycine accelerates that process. So the rate determining step actually changes from one that's primarily the CH activation, uh, CH activation step in the presence of the amino acid derivative, but it's the formation of the complex in the absence of that uh, additive. The uh, acceleration is modest, it's about fourfold, but it has a significant effect on the yield when these reactions are run, for example, for 24 hours. Next slide, please. We're also trying to develop ways to uh, more rapidly screen for new templates for other kinds of derivatives. The idea here is that at the current stage, uh, use group is able to screen a lot more things experimentally than we are able to do computationally because there are a lot, lots of uh, calculations required for testing of each one of these systems. So what we're doing now is testing a force field method, and I'll tell you about the preliminary results of that. We first use DFT to calculate the transition state. So this is the transition state for the preferred reaction involving the palladium silver dimer that I mentioned already. And what we then do in order to do a force field calculation is to remove the palladium and in fact, all of the apparatus that's doing the CH activation and freeze the positions of the atoms or the dis some distances and, and dihedral angles and angles uh, as re represented by the yellow atoms in the uh, structure in the second, the second structure. Uh, we then, uh, fixing those positions, are able to do force field calculations on a variety of different 
uh, possible templates. And what I've shown in the third uh, column is three different transition state models, ortho, meta, or para, obtained by DFT, but with the uh, metal and the uh, reactive portion of the uh, complex removed. And then we're able to do, if we can show the next slide, um, force field calculations in which we vary hundreds of different uh, templates. We fully optimize those with force field calculations, calculate the strain energy, and then compare the strain energies for those different uh, templates to the experimental uh, preferences found in the reaction. Next slide, please. And here's an example of how that works. Um, everything is just testing experiment versus calculation, except for the red point. I'll mention that in a moment. So these are uh, a number of different templates that have been used. And on the uh, y-axis is the experimental difference in the free energy of activation that leads to the uh, meta-ortho ratio. And in the, on the x-axis is the difference in uh, strain energy from our force field model. And as you can see, there's a, quite a good correlation. So far, one, one of our predictions has been tested. That's the red uh, diamond there. It obviously works very well. But the U group is testing a number of other uh, of, of our predictions as well to, to validate this approach. Next slide, please. So I'd like to turn to something completely different uh, having to do with a uh, well-known reaction from the Stoltz and Grubbs group. Next slide. Uh, the work here has been done by Yinfeng Yang again, a postdoc in my group, and Yang Liang, a former postdoc, who's now a professor at Nanjing. Next slide. The last year, uh, the Stoltz and Grubbs group published the fact that a variety of heterocycles could be silylated uh, with potassium T-butoxide as a catalyst. Hydrogen has evolved. The reaction is, uh, can be scaled up, uh, can be run in, in, in quite a large scale. There's some selectivity shown in the bottom part of the slide where uh, thiophene is, is uh, more reactive than furan, and furan is more reactive than perol. Uh, the reaction is catalyzed nicely by potassium T-butoxide, but not by sodium T-butoxide. There is some evidence for radical intermediates from uh, shutting down the reaction with radical traps or by detection of radical intermediates by ESR. Next slide, please. So we've been exploring this computationally. Uh, the mechanism is somewhat controversial, and I'll tell you where we stand at, so far on um, these results. First of all, some words about potassium T-butoxide. It's known to be a tetramer. Uh, the comp computed structure is shown on the far left of the slide. To dissociate that to the dimer uh, requires about nine kilocalories in THF, and uh, to dissociate that to a monomer is, is much more energetically costly. So as you'll see, um, my mechanism is going to involve the potassium T-butoxide tetramer. Interestingly, sodium T-butoxide, uh, which isn't active, is also a tetramer, but it's much more difficult to dissociate. Next slide, please. So the mechanism we've explored that does explain all the selectivities that have been observed, the regioselectivity and the substrate selectivity, is a radical chain mechanism. Starting on the left, a trimethylsilyl radical is generated by uh, a way that I'll describe later. Uh, I'm talking here about N-methyl indole. It's attacked preferentially at the two position to get this radical intermediate. And then we believe that the potassium T-butoxide tetramer, I've just got KOTBU in quotes here, abstracts a hydrogen atom to generate the product and generate an intermediate, which then uh, has an active hydrogen that can react with trimethyl silane uh, that's our model. The actual silane used was triethyl silane. Uh, but the KOTBUH, as I've described it, reacts with the silane to regenerate the silo radical and to continue the catalytic cycle. Next slide, please. Here are the uh, computed energetics. The blue is the observed reaction at the C2 position. The red is the uh, reaction at the C3 position. Kinetically, attack at the C2 position is strongly favored, although uh, there is a thermodynamic preference for attack at the uh, 3 position. And in fact, if the re reactions run long enough, the uh, 2 silo will gradually convert to the 3 silo derivative. Um, so just a little bit about this mechanism. So uh, I already described the silo radical attacking to give the intermediate 1, as it's called here. And then uh, potassium T-butoxide abstracts uh, hydrogen 
And that gives this uh, intermediate two. And if you show the next slide, there's a computed picture of this. <clears throat> it seems a little odd, but what it really is is a tertiary butanol replacing one of the T-butoxides. <clears throat> and the odd electron density is, is on the two potassiums that are coordinated to that T-butanol. The reaction is nearly uh, uh, thermoneutral, and uh, that's consistent with it being reversible and giving eventually thermodynamic preference. Next slide, please. Um, the sodium t butoxide, as I mentioned, uh, back up, yeah, thank you. Uh, sodium t butoxide is less effective, and in fact, it's less good as a hydrogen atom abstractor. It's about seven kilocalories more difficult, so that's another reason for the low reactivity of sodium t butoxide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Where does the radical chain and become initiated? Well, we don't know that for sure, and uh, there have been experiments, but no definitive evidence on that. Here is one possibility. Uh, we've tested a lot of different possibilities. This would be the, the tetramer reacting with traces of oxygen to generate uh, T-butoxide, uh, which can then either directly abstract hydrogen from trimethylsilane or can decompose to acetone and methyl radical, which would abstract the hydrogen. The overall process for formation of the trimethylsilyl radical is 31 kilocars. That's pretty high, uh, although this reaction, of course, doesn't have to uh, happen very often. It's just the initiation of the process. It's more difficult with sodium t butoxide. Next slide, please. And here's a picture of the um, what we predict is the result of potassium T-butoxide reacting with oxygen to generate the T-butoxyl radical and this oxygen complex. Next slide, please. So that's all I want to say about that. Um, I want to end the talk by briefly discussing some enzyme-catalyzed reactions. And this is work done in collaboration with David Sherman and John Montgomery at Michigan. And the work in my group was done by Jesse Grandner and Song Yang, two graduate students, and again, Yunfeng Yang. Next slide, please. We published uh, a paper in the, recently with the Sherman and Montgomery groups having to do with a cytochrome P450 called PIC-C that's involved in the picromycin biosynthesis. And there we uh, made some predictions about mutations that might in, improve the selectivity in reactions with menthol derivatives. I won't talk about that today, but I'd like to talk about another ongoing project, next slide please, in which we uh, investigated uh, some aspects of the uh, enzyme MCG, it's another P450, that's involved in the biosynthesis of mycinomycin 2. On this slide, there's some uh, perhaps kind of small drawings, but uh, M4 is a, a precursor to M2. M2 is shown in the middle of the slide. And M4 is oxidized by P450 to give both uh, allylic hydroxylation and epoxidation. Uh, there's also a side product called M1, which is uh, epoxidized, but that is shown not to go on to form the allylic um, hydroxyl group as well. So we first of all, wanted to try to understand what controls uh, the fact that M1 cannot be further oxidized. Next slide. And uh, we did some model system calculations. Uh, here is in the box are just shown uh, our calculation, our calculated activation air energies for the allylic hydroxylation that has a barrier of about 15 kilocalories per mole. But the uh, oxidation of the same position in the epoxide is much more difficult, about five kilocalories per mole higher in energy. And uh, shown below are the transition states. We're doing a model system here. It's a iron oxo porphyrin with a um, methylthiolate ligand uh, reacting with these two model systems. The difference here is primarily just one of allylic stabilization. Uh, epoxidation eliminates that. There's a small effect of the um, electron withdrawing nature of the epoxide, but mostly it's just the elimination of that uh, allylic stabilization upon loss of that proton. Next slide, please. We've also explored uh, perhaps an even more subtle factor, and that is that the sugar, uh, the mycinose is shown at the far left. There's a mycinose, that's a, uh, a species with two methoxy groups in the sugar, uh, is much more reactive towards this enzyme than either the um, 
monohydrox the monomethoxy or the the sugar that has no methoxy groups uh, and we've explored why that's true uh, we have done md calculations on the uh, reactions of the iron oxo species with these three different substrates we start from a crystal structure that's been obtained by larissa podust at uh, ucsf and uh, this was of the mic g with uh, e uh, with M4, uh, and uh, then we do calculations on a model for the iron oxo in which we first do some constrained optimizations and then uh, free optimizations and MD on the uh, complex. Next slide, please. And this is a blow up of the sugar, the dimethoxy sugar in, of M4 in a hydrophobic binding site. Um, next slide. This is a picture of the active site. That red is the oxygen attached to iron. And it's about uh, 2.7 angstroms on average from the hydrogen that's going to be abstracted. So it's in reasonable position. Uh, there has to be some motion, but uh, reasonable for that to be oxidized. Next slide. And finally, the, um, the amino sugar, uh, the disosamine that is, uh, has a nitrogen that's circled in a dashed orange line that's protonated in the enzyme and forms a salt bridge with the uh, two aspartates that are shown in the a blow up in the upper right. That the, Normally those aspartates are part of a salt bridge with that arginine. So this is all situated for a good reaction at that allylic hydrogen. Next slide please. But with the uh, M6 which is has the two hydroxyl groups. Uh, next slide. The sugar is now not bound as well in the hydrophobic site because the waters enter that site, presumably to, to uh, solvate the hydroxyl groups. Next slide, please. That causes the CH to be quite a bit further. This is almost four angstroms away from the iron oxo, uh, accounting for the much lower efficiency. Next slide. And finally, the, uh, the salt bridge is broken up somewhat. The um, the uh, uh, desosamine is no longer uh, as tightly associated with the aspartates. So this is our uh, description of why the different substrate selectivities are found with MCG. Next slide, please. So what I've tried to say today is, first of all, give you some idea about the kinds of quantum mechanical and um, electrodynamic methods that we use to study these kinds of reactions. Um, I think, I hope I've demonstrated the power of experimental chemists and computational chemists working together to get insight into the reactions. And finally, I've tried to cover something about how palladium, potassium t toxide and P450 enzymes catalyze the processes that they catalyze. Next slide. So that's the end of the talk. I'd like to thank my group. I'd like to thank the uh, the Selective CH Functionalization Center for support and the NSF that supports that center. Uh, and also the many sources that we've had of computational uh, power used in these calculations. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, uh, first of all, a question from Osaka University, Renato uh, Chitani. Uh, could you explain the reactivity order of different heteroarenes in the silation reaction with your computed radical mechanism? Uh, yes, we were able to do that. In fact, there is some uh, evidence in other radical reactions that that same order of reactivity is observed. So we've calculated the activation barriers for the uh, different heterocycles, and they do follow the order that is found experimentally. Uh, yes, we were able to do that. In fact, okay, great. And the second question uh, from Jan ha John Hammer at Longwood. He was wondering, could you imagine an ionic mechanism for the silation, silation reaction, and would it be possible to interrogate it via mass spectrometry, maybe with Dixet? <laughs> well, uh, as you know, uh, Dick has done exactly that kind of study, has observed some anionic uh, species, and has proposed an anionic mechanism. And we're working together on that. Uh, in fact, the computations uh, suggest, primarily because of the aggregation of the potassium TP toxide, that those 
that mechanism is higher in energy, uh, but we're still exploring that along with Dick. We're working together on that. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Ken. A really spectacular talk. And okay, I think it really, 